My name is Mark. I'm the senior high pastor here at the church. And we encourage our students to reflect on their story so they can articulate it. And you're going to hear one of those stories right now. Please welcome with me Minnetonka senior, Holly Beachy. My story begins in Colorado, where I was born and blessed with two wonderful Christian parents who love Jesus very much. I was always a bright and happy child. Jesus came into my life at a very young age. Fast forward through some of my more simple years into sixth grade, when my parents told me that we would be picking up everything we knew and moving to Minnesota for a change in my dad's job. I initially pushed positivity, told myself that all would be okay, but I did not realize what was ahead. As I soon started at a new school and began a new life, I had never felt so alone. I dug myself into a hole of ugly emotions I didn't know I had, and I lost faith that this change could ever turn into something good. Instead of turning to God, I blamed him. I put on a good face, but I was hurting very deeply. I felt isolated, uncomfortable, and hopeless. I didn't realize that the hole I felt in my life was God-shaped. For years, I continued to struggle. And as time went on, the severity of my struggles increased and changed. Just wanting to fit in led to depression and self-harm. Then there was partying, wanting to be popular, and putting my self-worth in the relationships that I was pursuing, which made for a lack of confidence, a lack of excitement for the future, a lack of feeling anything at all, which ultimately left me feeling more empty than ever and so sure that I had no purpose. There were even thoughts of ending my own life. My hurt stretched far, my pain cut deep. Every day was a battle within my own heart and mind. As I spiraled into this long and dark tunnel, my life felt meaningless. Small glimpses of light, of light would appear now and then, but I could never hold on to them from, for long. Running from God was a hobby. I thought I could conquer these hurts on my own. I kept trying to fill the gap with what I knew, but the world and the things in it never filled or satisfied the hole I felt in my life. But through persistent friendships and my loving parents, I caught a hold of something more, something that not only filled the hole, but filled it with grace. The Jesus that I once chatted about as a child started showing up in the people and the places around me. I was invited to attend a Bible study and saw hope there that so obviously came from him. I was drawn in and realized that what had been missing in my life was an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. With him, not only was I freed and forgiven from my desire to be one with the world, I was given a desire for more than that, for Jesus. My problems didn't automatically go away. I still struggle just like anyone else. Without Jesus, I would be a wreck. But I have the joy and the comfort of knowing that the same God who so perfectly put the universe together has a tight hold on my heart and on my life. The Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. It is a privilege to look back and see how God took brokenness and transformed it into something he could surely use. It is a privilege to look back and see that God has been using every trial and every heartbreak to draw me close and allow him to have the pen in writing the rest of my story. And it is a privilege to know that going forward, my weakness and my sin is absolutely renewed in God's power. I am not my past. I am a daughter of the King. This is not the story of Holly Beachy. This is the story of Jesus Christ. Thank you. So my, Mark and I are kind of super excited to take the stage this weekend and share it as we give you a glimpse into the world that we spend in every day, and that's the world of a teenager. I love to know and be known, so it seems only right that we would tell you a little bit about ourselves. And since okay. we've known each other for six years now, partnering in student ministries, we thought we would introduce each other. Okay. So, a couple fun things you need to know about Mark Warder. Uh, Mark was a huge athlete, emphasis on huge, in high school and college. He, he played football, hockey, and track and field. He and his wife met while they were both teaching at Eastview High School, and they were set up by their high school students. <laughs> 
He married True. Kelly, and they have a beautiful family in uh, Leah and Will, and Mark loves his family. When he was first married, he and Kelly moved to Bolivia and then Panama for seven years total when they first got married. I mean, that's crazy. We recommend it to everyone, get married and just leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's biblical, awesome. leave that's and cleave, right? right? All right, good. Go. Uh, Mark plays the guitar, he sings, and he can run really fast. And last year, he actually took a course on stand-up comedy. That's not a joke. <laughs> All right, so Heather, you always seem to have an accurate account on just about everything in your life. Yeah, that's So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You'll respond with a number. Okay. Okay, here we go. You're the youngest of how many siblings? Six, and my mother is like a saint. I think, she's, I think she's here this morning. My is mother she? is here this Where is morning. She? She's over here. Mom, can you wave? All right, I stand, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, ready? Here's the next one. How many pairs of shorts do you have? I own 98 pair of shorts. Uh, I only own one pair of jeans and they still have the tags on them. I've not worn jeans since October of 1999. Some of these students weren't born in 1999. No. <laughs> Just hot okay. all the time. Okay, yeah. next one. How many bottles of nail polish do you own? The last time junior high girls counted, I had 306 bottles of nail polish. There's a lot of junior high girls' nails to be painted. Well, and that's, it's all for ministry. That's, that's, why, right. that's why I have it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me ask this. How many ti Tigger items do you have in your Tigger room? Uh, 58 Tigger items and counting. Any, yeah. Anybody else here have a Tigger room in your house? <laughs> uh, okay, just one. How many times do you speak a year? You mean like speak to students? Inside and outside of Wooddale. Wow, I would guess like 160 times a year. Yeah. <laughs> many of us I have been blessed, <laughs> right, by the speaking ministry of Heather. Hmm. It's been awesome. And how many years have you worked as the junior high pastor at Wooddale Church? I will start year 20 on December 1st. Incredible. <laughs> That is not a common thing in student ministries. And my hair looks the same as it did my first day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and how many junior high students have you spoken to over that span, would you say? I mean, if there are about 100 kids per class, yeah. I would guess over 2,000 kids have come through the program. That's incredible, <laughs> right? And how many more years are you going to work with, high school, with, with junior high students? Well, my goal is to be 80 years old and holding in my dentures while I ride the roller coaster at Valley Fair. So I'm 42, so I guess like 38 years more. <laughs> <laughs> And last question, um, um, how many husbands do you have? <laughs> Just kidding. I have one, and his name is Chad. Yeah. And uh, he's my schnooky. I call him that mostly in private, but sometimes in public. Uh, <laughs> I adore him. <laughs> um, I spend a lot of my time with students, but I do talk to adults. And many of them marvel at how different a teenager's life is today than when they were in high school or junior high. And I can see why they would say that, but there are a lot of similarities, adults in the room, between when we were students and when my students now are currently students. For instance, uh, our students sometimes have conflicts with their parents. Adults in the room, do you remember having conflicts with your parents? Probably over your choice of music and how loud that music was. Perhaps uh, you've had conflict on what to wear or what you could wear from your parents' perspective. Doing homework, there's conflict here with our students. Another similarity, our students are super excited to get their driver's license. And I know you were too. The cars we drive might be a little bit different, but we're excited to get our license. And for our students, friends are really important to them. They want to spend most of their time with their friends. Their friend's opinion matters more than anyone else in their lives. And when their friendships end, they're often devastated. And my guess is you know that similar kind of experience. So there are similarities, but there are definitely differences. Our students in 2015 have academic and athletic pressure that we can't even imagine as adults. So 
Tarman, Mark, and I have students in our ministry with three hours of homework a night, multiple nights a week. We have seventh graders who are on traveling soccer teams with tournaments in Kansas City and Chicago over the weekend. We have fifth graders who are being asked to choose their primary sports in fifth grade, backing away from all other sports so that they can invest in traveling teams and training in the off season. I was in volleyball in junior high, okay? And I was on the A team. It was serious, but I didn't even really think about volleyball until about the end of August each year. And that was mostly because I wanted to get my new pair of Nikes with the powder blue swoosh on the side. It really didn't have anything to do with my intensity. It's so different. And because of the weight of these pressures through academics and through athletics, our students struggle with severe anxiety, depression, fear of failure, and self-harm. They actually get so stressed out that they hurt themselves physically in order to try to relieve some of that stress for even a moment. Technology is definitely different. Just for fun, raise your hand if you grew up and in your home there was a phone with a cord attached to it. Hey, yes! Okay, raise your hand if you have ever used a typewriter, <laughs> okay? Raise your hand if your computer uh, interaction when you were in school consisted of playing Oregon Trail and Blackjack. Yep, mine too. <laughs> and now we have toddlers who can navigate an iPad better than any adult that's in the room. We have third graders with cell phones. We have high schoolers who will binge watch on Netflix for nine hours straight. I mean, who would have known 25 years ago that we would have a term called screen time and that we would need to limit it so we could have a technology-free meal together as a family? Things have changed in technology. Another big concern for us as ministers to these students is that they are growing up in a sexually saturated culture. Everywhere a young person looks, she sees images that we adults did not see in public or on mainstream television. And when a young man walks past a Victoria's Secret window at a mall, he sees images that we would only have seen in bad magazines. It's different. And there are things that have changed over the years for sure, but there are things that have not changed. Yeah, in the midst of all the differences and all the similarities, there are two truths that will never change throughout all the generations. It comes from this verse in John 10. It says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come... Jesus' words, that they may have life and have it to the full. Think about that. Two very contrasting statements summarized like this. The enemy is out to get you, and Jesus is standing with you. The enemy is out to get you, and Jesus is standing with you. If you're 15, if you're 45, if you're 75, the enemy is out to get you, and Jesus is standing with you. So with all of this struggle. Let me ask these questions. Anyone here have tension with your parents? A little bit, right? Uh, anyone here have struggles with your siblings? You might be sitting by one. Don't elbow them right now. They just did. Anyone have problems with your classmates or your teachers, right? Anyone here have issues with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? They're like, I don't have a boyfriend, mom, dad, no. Um, hey, let me talk to those of you that are above the age of 18. Anyone here have struggles with your kids? Can I get an amen from the moms and the dads in the room? Anyone here have tension with your spouse? Anyone here have tension on the way to church here this morning? <laughs> or tension with your boss or, or your coworkers? And we so often can, can point fingers and put the blame on those people for their actions, and people need to take responsibility, obviously. We forget, though, that there is an enemy that is out to get you and me, that there is a spiritual battle that's raging. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this passage in John 10. If you have your Bibles, you can take those out. The context here as we pull back and take a 30,000-foot view of this is that Jesus is teaching and healing 
and he's changing his environment. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees, don't like it. And this is actually a conflict of questions that are being asked to Jesus. And it's interesting because Jesus, in these moments, gives hints about why he's here and what he's doing. And he does this by giving this example of a shepherd and a sheep. We're going to pick up the verse here in John 10, verse 7. Therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate, here's one of the I am's, for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Here's verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And it's important not to stop reading there because this verse is is so connected to this John 10 passage. Verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So there is this tension and Jesus is saying, I have come to change the tension. And this tension is not new. Every generation has experienced it and continues even today. But the tension started at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. When they believed that having their own path and their own plan was better than God's. Don't we sometimes do that? And because they chose to eat the fruit from the tree that that God told them not to eat, sin entered the world and broke this perfect relationship between God and man. So Jesus talks about how to change the tension. And he does it by calling us sheep. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and and say, you're a sheep. (laughs) Okay, now, it's interesting, right? Do you know that the IQ of a sheep is is not very high, okay? Um, We actually probably wouldn't know what the IQ of a sheep is because, you know, sheep can't take multiple choice tests and hold number two pencils, right? Okay, I'll take more stand-up comedy classes. Sorry, that joke (laughs) did not work very well. But listen, the IQ of a sheep would be low, right? And, and the best thing that could happen to a sheep is getting a shepherd. Think about the life expectancy. It'd go from this to this because the shepherd is there to guide and care and protect the sheep. And when the sheep goes off the path by himself, anything can happen. That actually happened a couple years ago in New Zealand. A shepherd lost his sheep and was searching for his sheep for six years. The sheep had wandered off, gone into a cave, had kind of dodged here and there. And then the shepherd found him and he looked like this. (laughs) This is Shrek the sheep. Isn't he amazing? I told Heather last night, I want a poster of Shrek in my office. You just want to kind of reach out and grab him? Okay, listen. When they sheared him... 60 pounds of wool. It could actually make up to 20 men's suits. Isn't that crazy? Now, what's interesting about his experience, because um, at this point, obviously, he's still alive and he came back with the rest of the sheep. But if a sheep like this falls down, he can't get up. He can't get up and, and then he dies. And so we're reminded here that the sheep is better with the shepherd in the same way. Jesus said, I've come to give you life. Life is better with Jesus. Amen? And if you don't know this Jesus, we would love to walk along with you and help you experience this relationship that he wants to have you. Embrace the good shepherd. See, he's the source of life. And in the midst of this battle and this tension, he's also the power over it. And so until we realize that there is an enemy that's out to get you, Until we realize that Jesus, the good shepherd, is standing with you, we truly won't live life to the full. It's because of this tension that John 10.10 displays that Mark and Tarman and I are committed to consistently reveal Satan's tactics to steal, kill, and destroy. And not only do we reveal them to the students, but we, we combat them with the truth of Scripture. 
And so Mark and I thought it would be fun if continuing in this series called The Book of You, written by God, but to this weekend with a youth emphasis, if we were to highlight four core truths that we speak into this generation. One of the core truths that our students hear and hopefully see from the time they enter the fifth grade is you are capable of so much more than others give you credit for. As youth pastors, we're not naive to what the general public thinks of teenagers. <laughs> Most people label teenagers as lazy, defiant, snotty, disinterested, entitled, disrespectful, and selfish. And many teenagers, when they pick up on these labels, actually begin to live into those descriptors. So from the start of their adolescent experience, we want them to know you are capable of so much more than others give you credit for. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 is written by David, who, by the way, was in his late teens when he was called to be the king of Israel. And here he is praising God for how he crafted him and created him before he even took one breath. David says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So every one of our students was created on purpose and with purpose by the God of the universe. The God who created the majestic mountains and the raging seas created our students. And Genesis 1 tells us that they were created in the image of God, which means that they bear similar qualities to God. So they have creativity and intelligence and reasoning and relational drive and emotion. And we want them to know that on a regular basis. As we read 1 Timothy 4.12, it seems that the negative labels that we see being placed on teenagers today might have been an issue even during the time of the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he writes to young Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but because you are capable of more than others give you credit for, set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The enemy would love it if our fifth through 12th graders would believe and become what the others think most about them. But we know that there's a different way. We know that Jesus has come to redeem these students and to remind them of who they are in him, no matter what their developmental stage is in life. They're not writing their stories. The enemy certainly is not writing their stories. God is writing their stories. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. The second truth that we're speaking into this generation is that your faith doesn't depend on your feelings. And a lot of times we would associate teens with having a lot of drama and, and having their emotions, you know, well up in them and react upon those emotions. But we know that in Psalm 1, 1 through 3, it says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit at the company of mockers. But blessed is, but whose, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whether they, whatever they do prospers. Now, I love going to retreats and conferences and some of my most memorable spiritual moments in my life have been overwhelmed with emotion. And God has given us those emotions to experience. It's a powerful thing to feel the presence of God, right? But a spiritual high can't last forever. And, and you'd obviously never know what it was if it didn't. Coming down from the spiritual mountain is okay, but then what happens after that? The weeks and the months after, so often we can say, well, now I can't feel God. He's not there for me. I feel all alone. I don't feel loved at all. 
And this is where we have to stay rooted in the word of God. Even though I feel alone, Jesus says in Matthew 28, surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And even though I feel unloved, I know that in John 3, it says that God loves the whole world, that he sent Jesus to die for me. Your life has to be focused on the voice, the words of the shepherd. It's the voice that brings this life. Third core truth. Your worth is not based on your performance, your relationships, or your appearance. As our students move throughout their days, they are tempted to find their identity in everything but Jesus Christ. And in my nearly 24 years of youth ministry, I have come to understand that Teenagers go to three different wells in order to draw their identity. And those are performance, relationship, and appearance. The performance should be pretty obvious. Have you ever spent time in a room with a nine-month-old and a bunch of adults? It's really an interesting setting. Every little move that nine-month-old Billy makes is cheered for right? Every step that he takes is documented for the blog later. And when his chubby little wobbly legs actually make it all the way across the room, the room erupts in applause. So at nine months old, Billy is beginning to understand that if he does something, people are happy and they will applaud and it makes him feel good. So even before he gets to be one year old, Billy is being programmed to perform. If it's not performance for a student, it could be that they draw their worth from their appearance. Whether they're male or female, they have messages being communicated every day as to what they should look like. Students, they tell you what your hair should look like, your abs, your nails, your teeth, your backside. Adults, do you know that there's even a sad focus for girls on the desired gap in between their inner thighs? And we haven't even gotten to the outward clothing yet. But these messages say, if you look like this, you will feel satisfied, you'll have fun, you'll be popular, and ultimately, you will have value. If it's not performance and if it's not appearance, then it could be relationships that they draw their identity from. And this one's a little trickier because we were created by God to be in relationships. First and foremost, in a relationship with him. But then he gave us this beautiful gift of being in relationship with each other. But the tricky part is, when we're hardwired to be in those relationships, it can lead us to a place where we're finding our, re our worth in the relationships that really don't matter as much as the one relationship that should. So we have students who all day long, these kinds of messages or questions are nagging them. Does my best friend like me as much as I like her? Is my teacher mad at me? Is my dad disappointed in me? If I become friends with this person, will I lose the popular status I've worked so hard for? Is he ignoring me? I mean, even as I ask these questions, I'm exhausted. <laughs> and it's, it's because it's not the way it's supposed to be. God designed us to get our worth and value from him alone. Paul figured it out. He figured out so much, but he displayed this in Philippians 3.8. He said, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Everything else is garbage in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. Doing your best at something, having friends, taking care of your appearance are not bad goals in and of themselves. But when they start to carry as much, if not more, weight than your value in Jesus Christ, they're garbage. And here's the last core truth we want to share with you that we're speaking into this generation. If you want to live life to the full, you have to walk in the Spirit. Now, in general, at the church in America, I feel like there's a great emphasis on God the Father. There's a great emphasis on Jesus the Savior. And then so often, we don't spend very much time talking about the Spirit. 
But the Spirit was sent to guide and lead us in the Christian life that God is calling us to live. It's, it's the Spirit that's the key. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's the tension again. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Walking in the Spirit means realizing that you need God every single day. And it's becoming aware of His presence all throughout the day. I had this experience that is similar to this where I was taking a run at Lebanon Hills over in Egan and I was training for an event and I had already done two laps around the trail. And on the third lap, I decided to take out my earbuds, put them in my pocket, and I just observed nature around me. I started to um, hear my footsteps. I could hear my breath. I could smell, you know, the, 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 the air around me. These two birds, you know, flew over there, the squirrel over here. And I realized that they were there the whole time. It was, it was my conscious decision to be aware of them in that moment allowed me to enjoy them so much more. It's learning how to be aware of his presence in the present. It's a daily reliance. But then as you grow and mature, it goes from just getting up in the morning and spending time in your Bible and devotion, but then it's, it's taking the good shepherd with you. It's, it's not only hour by hour, but, but minute by minute and moment by moment as you walk in the Spirit. So these are our four core truths, but here's a bonus truth for you. These are not just truths for junior hires and high schoolers and fifth and sixth graders. They are for you. And we hope that as we have been sharing, there has been a stirring inside of you like, oh, I don't have that figured out yet. Oh, I need to hear that. <laughs> that was our hope. We're kind of tricky that way. But it is true that these truths happen. But think about it. Maybe you're a recently divorced single parent of three, and you need to claim today that you are capable of so much more than others give you credit for. You're created in the image of God, and his power and his supernatural strength is yours on a daily basis. Or maybe you're an unemployed 50-year-old and you need to be reminded that your faith doesn't depend on your feelings. Yeah. And you might feel as if God has looked away from your situation. You might feel discouraged, but take hope because God has a plan for your life and God is standing with you. Maybe you're a 27-year-old single person who feels like you need to change something in order to get someone. Or you're a 40-year-old stay-at-home mom who feels like she doesn't matter because she can't produce a paycheck. Or you're a widower and your friendships are lessening and changing. Then today you need the truth that your worth is not based on your performance, your relationships, or your appearance. It's based on the fact that you were created in the image of God and Jesus Christ died for you. Yeah. Or maybe someone who, who's been a Christian for a long time, since childhood, and you might consider your faith to be mediocre or common or yeah. just routine. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. If you want to live life to the full, you need to walk in the Spirit, and that can start in this moment right now. Yeah. To close our time, we would love to pray, but because we like students so much, we'd love to pray over them. So students, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand wherever you are if you're in fifth through 12th grade. And adults, as you are praying with us, if you feel comfortable to just raise out your hand toward a student that's near you to say that you agree in our blessing of them, that would be really cool. So yeah. fifth through 12th graders, no matter where you are, stand up around the room, and we would love to pray for you, and then you can stay standing as we do one more worship song together. Let's yeah. pray. Gracious Father, we just praise you and thank you for this weekend where we can highlight um, this amazing group of people that you have created. And God, I thank you for the truth of this morning. And I pray that um, for students and adults alike, we would not just hear it, but we would understand the truth and it would make a difference in our lives. Yeah. Father, we pray over these students that you would bless them. God, we ask for your protection over them against the enemy. God, I pray that they would embrace that the good shepherd is standing with them and walking with them all throughout their days. 
God, bless their families. Help all of them to know, understand, and, and remember that Jesus, you're all they need. Mm. So we pray for you to bless them in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen.